Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, of course, I, I want to thank the organizers for uh, setting up this wonderful symposium and uh, the Copley Foundation for supporting uh, it as well. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to speak uh, here about this work because uh, this is my hometown. I grew up in uh, San Antonio, Texas and spent 18 years here and grew up here. Uh, so it, it's very exciting to be able to do that. I'm going to talk about the history of single molecule uh, spectroscopy, imaging, and photocontrol and how they connect to super resolution. Uh, so in order to do this, let's go back to the mid-1980s uh, when there was a, really a, a lot of exciting physics going on. Uh, single ions were being measured and, and spectroscopy was being done, beautiful spectroscopy on ions and traps. Uh, there was also single atoms by STM and that sort of thing. But what about molecules? Uh, why hadn't anyone really uh, done these sorts of things with molecules? Well, <clears throat> there was a problem, really. Uh, and, and that's coming from this, these uh, words of th this great physicist, Erwin Schrodinger, uh, one of the founders of quantum mechanics, who really felt that you never experiment with just one electron atom or molecule. Uh, and he wasn't the only person who thought it wasn't possible. So my story really has to explain to you how I got to the point to believe that it was possible. And that takes us back to uh, spectroscopy and putting molecules in solids. So let me review some of those key concepts now. So imagine that you take a molecule like this uh, terrylene molecule and put it in a transparent host of paraterphenyl. And if you measured it at room temperature, you'd see a fairly large absorption, fairly broad absorption line, uh, 50 nanometers in width. Uh, but if you cool that sample to low temperatures, uh, a few degrees Kelvin or so, where all phonons and vibrations are all turned off, and I've picked a molecule that has a strong zero phonon electronic transition, then the lowest transition becomes extremely narrow. You can see here there are actually four sites, four different inequivalent locations for uh, the terrylene in the host crystal. That's what these origin sites are, are labeled. And uh, for, the, for the general audience, the broad audience, I'm showing you the sort of range of colors that correspond to these, this spectrum uh, <clears throat> and the frequencies, uh, hundreds of terahertz. Well, uh, this is still not resolving the shapes of these uh, origins. So if you do a, a more high resolution spectroscopy, uh, then you might see an, an image like this, uh, not an image, but a spectrum. This is from Erlowski and Zewail back in 1979, now looking at penicene in paraterphenyl, a similar molecule, rigid, flat, aromatic, and so forth. And here only two of the origins are shown. Uh, and it, now it's beginning to look like a Gaussian profile, some sort of a Gaussian-shaped line. Uh, and resolution, pretty good, 0.09 uh, inverse wave numbers. But the question is, is this all there is? Uh, and of course, there, that, there is a lot more. What's the problem here? This, these lines are too broad still. The excited state lifetime would predict that you should see much, much narrower lines than, than, these, uh, than these lines. So the, what this means is what's going on, really, as is, 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 uh, illustrated in this little cartoon, that is a, an inhomogeneously broadened line. It's really composed of many narrow homogeneous absorptions that are spread over different frequencies because of the differences in the, in the local environments in, in the solid. So uh, this phenomenon, of course, uh, inhomogeneous broadening, was under great study during that, that, the time period of the 70s and 80s by, by many scientists. Uh, and uh, people wanted to know what those homogeneous widths were, for example. And at this time, I was at the IBM Research Labs in San Jose. Uh, and we were actually wanting to use these inhomogeneously broadened lines for an application. So that application w was spectral hole burning. Uh, spectral hole burning uh, works when you have this inhomogeneously broadened line and you take a narrow uh, pumping laser. Uh, the lasers were about a megahertz in width now, so they're very extremely narrow, much narrower than everything here. Uh, they would only pump those molecules that are in resonance. And if you have some mechanism that causes the molecules to change, to go to some other place in frequency space. Then what's left behind is a reduced absorption in the inhomogeneous line called a, uh, it's like a dip, but it was termed a spectral hole, uh, first observed by uh, two Russian groups in the 1970s. These spectral holes were interesting uh, at that time for us because uh, we were exploring the idea to use them as optical storage, uh, to use the fact that this inhomogeneously broadened line is typically a thousand times broader than the homogeneous width, and so you could march across that inhomogeneous line, making holes, ones and zeros, one zero, one zero, whatever you wanted, uh, and record many bits in the same focal spot uh, by, by using spectral hole burning. This is something I studied in my graduate work with Al Sievers and Andy Kriplivy. Uh, and here at IBM, 
the, the idea was, and it was sort of the great years of, of this particular uh, industrial research lab in terms of being able to do f uh, physical science, uh, and uh, there's, uh, you could explore new mechanisms, you could explore new ways to, to sort of implement this in an engineering sense, but you could also ask questions about the fundamental limits of the idea. And that's, the, that's where the hook becomes closer to single molecule. What are the ultimate limits to this idea of frequency domain optical storage? Well, it turned out that uh, we, uh, my collaborators and I there explored several different mechanisms, but one that stuck out for me was this particular question. Is there some spectral roughness on this inhomogeneously broadened line that was thought to be smooth and Gaussian uh, that might be resulting from statistical number fluctuations or the number of molecules that are in resonance at each wavelength, coming from the discreteness of the molecule? And if there were such a roughness, then that would define the smallest spectral hole that, that could be detected. So, it, of course, this phenomenon had not been observed in the late uh, 1980s, and so we set out to observe it. Uh, with my postdoc, Tom Carter, at the time, uh, taking penicine and paratrophenol at low temperatures, we uh, decided to take a very close look at the shape of the inhomogeneously broadened line, and this is what we saw. It's really amazing. This inhomogeneously broadened line is spread out to be extremely broad now on this frequency scale, and you see this structure. Uh, it's, and it's not noise, because if you measure it once and then measure it again, you see exactly the same structure. Uh, so this is what we called it, statistical fine structure. And where is it coming from? Well, it's coming from, as I said, the, the differences in the numbers of molecules that are present at each wavelength. If your total absorption scales as the number of molecules in resonance, this effect uh, uh, has scales in, rel in uh, RMS size as the square root of the number of molecules in resonance. Uh, we were able to do this by using uh, FM spectroscopy, which I'll explain in a moment, a method that only measures the difference in absorptions uh, at a, over a certain spectral scale. And so it was ideally suited for observing this fine structure. Well, the other aspect about the statistical fine structure is that um, beside it coming from the discreteness of the molecule, it also shows you some fascinating scaling. Imagine a spectral feature whose amplitude or size depends upon the square root of n. Um, it, for example, if this uh, average absorption here comes from a thousand molecules, uh, <clears throat> then the fine structure has a uh, size of about the square root of a thousand, or about 32. In other words, if I want to go to the single molecule limit, I only have to work 32 times harder, not a thousand times harder. Once you can see this effect, uh, scaling as a square root of n, that's in your favor in terms of pushing it to the n equal to 1 limit. So that's why we continue to use this method, FM spectroscopy, to go to the single molecule limit. <clears throat> because it I realized it wasn't going to be a thousand times harder. So in 1989, with uh, Lothar Kador, uh, we uh, pushed that method, FM spectroscopy, invented by Gary Bjorklund a few years er earlier, uh, to the single molecule limit. Uh, and in this particular uh, way of doing the experiment, the FM gives you two copies of the spectral feature of opposite sign, and we use then a modulation method to remove some technical noise. So you want to see this W shape, which we saw, uh, for, again, for penicene and paratrophenol. So <clears throat> this is a measurement on the transmitted light. It's a measurement of absorption, and it's insensitive to scattering from the sample. We had a really cruddy sample for these experiments. It, it is, however, limited by laser shot noise, and since you have to not saturate the molecule, we couldn't turn up the intensity really high to get great signals of noise. We were limited by the intensity. We didn't want to broaden the spectral features. But nevertheless, this experiment showed that penicene and paratrophenol is an important model system uh, and would be uh, useful for, for single molecule experiments. This, this whole idea is very much like FM radio at 520 terahertz, 506 terahertz. Um, <clears throat> okay, so that was a, that an important step. Uh, but the, uh, another great step occurred a year later uh, when uh, Michel Ory also detected the, or the absorption from a single molecule. I mean, every experiment is an absorption experiment, but he uh, is detected it by recording the emitted fluorescence. Here are some of his data, uh, you know, homogeneously brought on lines, and these little dots here are the single molecules. Uh, and so you want to remember now that if this is collecting fluorescence, uh, that's a powerful thing to do, but you have to lower scattering backgrounds now. You have to be sure that any Rayleigh and Raman scattering, etc., are all so small compared to the emission from the molecule in order to detect them. Well, that is doable. That can be done. And uh, so this was an important step forward. And I, I, I like to say that uh, if there were a fourth Nobel Prize, uh, Michel uh, uh, Ory should have gotten it. Well, this uh, method now, detecting single molecule absorption by fluorescence, sort of swept the field 
uh, in uh, that time period now in the early 90s. And here's some examples of the neat things that were done. Uh, now with Pat Ambrose from my lab, we're looking at penicillin and paratrophenyl. Here's the inhomogeneously broadened line again. Now if you blow it up, you see these beautiful isolated single molecules. You look at just one of them. The width of this molecule's absorption is only 7.6 megahertz. 7.6 megahertz at a center frequency of 506 terahertz. A Q of nearly 10 to the 8. It's, a, it's spectacular for spectroscopy. A, a beautiful narrow line allows you to detect uh, very subtle features, uh, stark effects, and all sorts of things. Also in, the, in those early days, we started measuring images of the single molecules. And here's one. Uh, this axis is the, uh, the laser color or frequency axis. Uh, but this other axis is a spatial axis where we move the focal spot of the laser across the sample. And we knew at this time that what's really going on here is that the molecule is measuring the shape of the laser spot. I mean, the molecule is about uh, a nanometer in size, and it measures the local electromagnetic field dotted into its uh, transition dipole moment, uh, quantity squared. Uh, but uh, we knew at this point, though, that uh, what was important to us, at least we weren't thinking about spatial resolution. We, we had tons of spectral resolution. Everything is fully resolved here. The la the, uh, it, it is not limited by the laser or any measurement in the spectral domain, and we weren't thinking about spatial stuff at this time, because we had such good resolution in frequency space. Uh, very quickly after that, um, uh, Urs Wilt's lab did some two-dimensional images of single molecules here in reversed contrast. But you see, once this new regime was opened up and people started to do experiments, uh, it, the, the neat thing that happens when you get into that regime is that there are often surprises. I want to show you a couple of those surprises now. Here's an example of uh, some multiple traces, scanning the laser many, many times. Uh, you're looking at an old oscilloscope, you're looking at just a, you know, a video camera that was taking pictures of the oscilloscope, and you see a single molecule there, but wait a minute, something weird is going on. You see the molecule is jumping from one frequency to another. Uh, it's not staying fixed. Even though we're at two degrees Kelvin and we're in a crystal, wh why should this be going on? This really surprised us and we got very excited and had a lot of fun with this. It turns out what we're watching is what's called spectral diffusion that was uh, uh, explored in, in, on polymers but never seen at the single molecule level before. Uh, local, uh, low frequency uh, perturbations coming from the nearby host crystal, some defects in the crystal, uh, even at this low temperature, are undergoing tunneling transitions that are shifting the molecule absorption back and forth. You also can see if I put the laser at a fixed frequency here, then the molecule sometimes is in resonance, you get a lot of light, and then sometimes it's out of resonance, you get no light. These molecules would be, are blinking on and off for a fixed uh, laser frequency of excitation. Beautiful theory was done uh, by Eric, uh, by, uh, in, th in this case, uh, Jim Skinner and uh, Phil Riley and so forth, uh, and, and that was all a wonderful thing. Another surprise occurred, and this now worked by uh, Thomas Bachet for perylene in polyethylene. Uh, look what happened with these experiments. Here's a single molecule that you scan over again and again. Nothing is happening. But then if you bring the laser into resonance and sit there for a moment and scan once more, the molecule's gone. It's moved somewhere else in frequency space, off scale. Wait a moment, wait a little while, comes back at the same frequency. And you can watch it again for multiple times and then drive it away again. We could drive the molecules back and forth with light. We were able to, using light, to control the molecules. And so, you know, given that this is this International Year of Light, I'm very happy to uh, be able to talk about this kind of work with you. All right, so the low temperature regime had a few interesting surprises, but uh, in, uh, in the mid-90s, people shifted to room temperature. So let me just pause a moment and sort of say why we would want to do these crazy experiments anyway at that time. Well, we were removing ensemble averaging, okay? We were able to watch individuals not have to, and not having to average over billions of molecules. That let us ex explore heterogeneity for sure, also heterogeneity in time as well as in, as in uh, static heterogeneity. Uh, and so that's, that's one of the main reasons people still do single molecule experiments. Uh, <clears throat> these molecules also enable imaging and detecting of nanometer scale interactions because they are essentially sensitive to their very local environment around this nanometer sized molecule. And they, of course, lead to super resolution, as I'll talk about in a moment. There are even some commercial applications now and some companies that are using single molecule imaging uh, for DNA sequencing and other ideas. So just to make sure uh, that everyone is on the same page here, in terms of how these experiments are now done at room temperature, uh, let me just illustrate that and, and remind you that in the, in the 90s, after the low temperature experiments, a number of people made important strides forward at, at, in the room temperature regime. Bursts of fluorescence from the Keller lab, 
near-field imaging by Betzig uh, and Shea and, and Ambrose, uh, confocal imaging, uh, wide-field imaging, and so forth. So a, a lot of people began to show that you could see this fluorescence from single molecules by a variety of methods. And all, and all of these experiments now work in this way. We, we pump the molecule while, while it's in these allowed singlet states and collect the emitted fluorescence and often avoid these dark states, but we'll use the dark states like triplet states and other dark states a, a little bit later. Now the, the labels I'm talking about are these small labels on the order of a couple of nanometers in size or fluorescent proteins. Uh, and you want to think of, and if you have, for example, a cell and you want to look at single molecules in a cell, you focus the laser down to the smallest spot you can focus, and that's limited by diffraction, just as Stefan Hell described, to be about 200, 250 nanometers, Abe's limit. So to see single molecules, you must dilute at room temperature. You don't have the laser frequency anymore to easily select different molecules, like at low temperature. You have to dilute, so the molecules must be farther apart than the size of the diffraction limited region. Uh, and then we collect this emitted fluorescence from the molecules. So um, <clears throat> some examples of things that occurred when you can see single molecules at room temperature are really fun to think about because they illustrate that the molecules tell us a lot about what's going on. Let's go into a cell, in fact, the membrane of a cell, uh, and look at some immune proteins that are labeled in the membrane. Uh, here you can see the spots are the single molecules, of course, but uh, the excitement that comes from the, the time-dependent movie of the, the dynamics of the system you can see that even at room temperature, there's this dance of mo molecules on the surface of the cell, something that's going on right now in the cells in your body, and even faster because you're, you're at 37C and this was 22C. You also see the molecules turning off. Some of that is photobleaching. You also see that maybe some of them are turning back on, which we'll come back in, in, a, in a few more moments. But the, the variable here is diffusion, motion. What is the membrane like? What can you learn by an inference from this motion? Another example from the bacterial regime uh, <clears throat> I want to illustrate because you see bacteria are really quite small, only a couple of microns in length and a half a micron across. And now I want to illustrate for uh, something called Colobacter uh, the time dependent motion on a time lapse sort of time scale. That is a very long time scale with dark periods in between. Just keep an eye where the, uh, where the uh, pointer is. And you see here uh, on this time lapse experiment, this single molecule is moving in a line a line across the cell and then turning and going around the back of the cell. This is not diffusive motion. This is not random motion. This is obviously directed motion. Uh, it tells us that something going on in the cell is moving this molecule. Turns out that this was actually due to uh, this uh, particular protein being associated with the cell wall machinery, cell wall formation machinery uh, around the circumference of the molecule. Here are some tracks of single molecules all showing this circumferential motion. And as a final example, let me talk about uh, a material science situation where I take terylene and just put it in a paratrophenyl crystal, now at room temperature, and just image. If you look closely at this movie, or sorry, at this image, you see that there are lots of little rings uh, in, the, in the movie. The rings are coming from molecules that are fixed in the, in the crystal, and their dipole moment is pointing out toward you, so you get a, a ring in the image. Uh, but uh, the other molecules, there's some others that don't have rings, and so look what they do. Those that don't have rings, are moving all over the place. Even in this crystal at room temperature, these molecules are moving long distances. And we puzzled about this for a while, but eventually realized that they are moving in the cracks of the crystal. The, in this experiment, the single molecules are telling you the shape and the positions of the cracks in the crystal, because this is very biased motion, not random diffusion. It's mostly along vertical lines or horizontal lines, the cracks. So my point here is that uh, so much is, is, is available from the single molecule regime in terms of watching the molecules. Now also, in the mid-90s, in fact 1997, we took a look at room temperature at single uh, fluorescent proteins. Uh, this was some protein that had been given to us by Roger Chen because uh, green fluorescent protein was sweeping the biological community at that time, and he and his uh, postdoc, uh, Andy Cubitt, made a particular mutant of, of GFP that emits in the yellow, so it's called yellow fluorescent protein or enhanced yellow fluorescent protein. And now Rob Dixon in my lab, now at UC San Diego, wanted to image single copies of YFP. That was easily done. Here, here's one of those images. You could see single copies of fluorescent protein. But once again, just like in the low temperature experiment, various surprises start appearing. The first surprise was that these molecules blink. That is, you, will, you can see the same molecule in frame after frame, but then it turns off and then spontaneously comes back on again, turns off, on, and so forth. As if the molecule is cycling here in the emissive states, goes into some dark state, but can tunnel back from the dark state. 
probably due to isomerization of, of the, uh, flow, the, the uh, chromophore inside the uh, barrel of GFP. But Rob also saw something else, that if you irradiate for a longer time, you can also see the molecule go into a long-lived dark state. That is, the molecule would appear to photobleach eventually after some blinking. But then if you use a little blue light, you can turn the molecule back on again and uh, see it for, uh, emit for a long time, eventually turn off, use blue light to turn it back on, and so forth. So we were able to use light to recover molecules that we thought had been photobleached. Another example of, of the richness and diversity of, of such an interesting system uh, where we have a, a protein holding a chromophore uh, where there can be lots of interesting photodynamics. Um, uh, after this, uh, a number of people started trying to develop fluorescent proteins uh, to be better switchers, even for optical storage, uh, like DROMPA, done by Miyawaki, but also photoactivatable GFP uh, by a group at uh, the NIH, which plays strongly in the, the story of Palm coming up. So that's, that's sort of the, the stage, the foundation, setting the stage for super resolution. Uh, now I want to start talking about super resolution itself uh, because I want to see how these ideas fit in to the, the, the beautiful things that, uh, that have been done in this uh, regime. And you heard already about an approach that doesn't require single molecule imaging. Uh, Stead and its relatives from Stefan Hell, uh, structured illumination microscopy from Mats Gustafsson also doesn't require single molecules. But I'm really going to uh, focus on talking about uh, approaches that require single molecule imaging, uh, which uh, cements my connection with Eric Betzig uh, and Harold Hess and so on. So how can we use these single molecule labels to surpass the diffraction limit? Uh, well, the answer is simple. If I state it in a very general way, uh, you want to be able to image single molecules first, but then you also need to add two key ideas. And, and just to make sure no one is confused, my, my lab's contribution is to these, these foundations of these ideas. So uh, idea number one, <clears throat> super localization is what I like to call it. And, uh, and here's a sort of a simple analogy. This is a cr uh, in Crater Lake, Oregon. There's this cinder cone in the middle of the lake. And uh, here's my uh, uh, obligatory scale bar. This is 120 times 10 to the ninth nanometers. Uh, <clears throat> and, and you know very well that if you simply walk up to the top of this mountain with your, with your uh, cell phone, you can record the coordinates of the position of this uh, mountain to much better precision than the width of the mountain. Well, that's the idea being applied to single molecules. Find the position of the emitter by fitting the shape of the single molecule image. In other words, this image of the light from single molecules, you might think those are little disks, uh, but they're not just disks. Uh, if you spread them out over several pixels of the detector and take a cross section, you see that they have a shape. That is, the, the shape uh, is defined by the point spread function of the microscope. Uh, which is an airy function, but you can approximate that pretty closely with a Gaussian. So this data here is showing you that different pixels have a different probability of recording photons. And it's that information that we use to extract the position of the molecule by fitting to a model function, let's say a Gaussian, which does have a diffraction limited width, but its center position, the parameter corresponding to that fit from the center position, we know to much better precision than the width, uh, we like to call that the localization precision, which is uh, standard deviation sigma. And sigma scales in, in first order as the Abe limit, uh, the diffraction limit, divided by the square root of the number of photons detected. Each new photon is a sample of the position of the molecule. And so that's why the, the knowledge of the position gets much better as if you had done in measurements of its position. So, so this is great. This works fine when there's molecules that are, that are far separated from one another. And it's not new in science. This has been used uh, all the way back even as to the, the days of Heisenberg uh, to localize objects. But here we're localizing a single molecule, a, a one nanometer sized object, not a big object, uh, which makes these measurements something like endpoint correlation functions of the recorded photons. Well, <clears throat> uh, so what we want to do for resolution, of course, is to be able to separate two objects that are close together. And I just want to point out that there were important steps toward super resolution with single molecule emitters. There was a, uh, a, a seminal paper written by Eric Betzig in 1995 where he basically proposed that let's use another control variable to separate the molecules along another dimension that might be, even though they're overlapped in the spatial dimensions, let's use another control variable. And he suggested spectral tunability. Then in 1998, uh, a group of uh, single molecule low temperature people did demonstrate that idea. Uh, by separating uh, uh, seven or eight molecules and so forth that were within the diffraction limit uh, using spectral tunability that I've already described uh, to, to uh, allow you to determine their positions much better than the diffraction limit. 
uh, in X, Y, and Z. <clears throat> and there were a number of groups that also used other ideas to try to separate molecules, such as lifetimes and, and uh, uh, photo bleaching effects, different colors, and things like that uh, in, the, in the early 2000s. But the real uh, step forward to make this idea really fully general occurred in 2006, and so I want to describe that now in a, as a, a, in a very general way. Key idea number two is to actively control the emitting concentration and then do sequential imaging of the single molecules. If you have a structure that you want to observe and have a no active control, of course you want to label it with all those fluorophores that are the labels. And then, uh, if you allow all of them to emit at the same time, then you get this diffraction-limited blurry image. So you can see the solution now, the way I've set it up. You simply don't allow them to emit all at the same time. Uh, if you can actively control the emitting concentration some way, let's say by photoactivation, that means they're all dark, they're not emitters until you activate them with some controlling light. Then you could activate them with a very dim controlling light and have only a few on, super localize these, photo bleach them, and then do it again, activate more, and do it again until you get many uh, positions of the single molecules by sampling of the structure. Finally, you can use a pointillist-like technique to reconstruct the underlying structure. So uh, this idea I first heard about in, in April 2006 from uh, Eric Betzig and Harold Hess at a meeting at the NIH uh, where they, they, they talked about this beautiful experiment, and you will hear a, a beautiful story about it in the next talk. Uh, very quickly after that, uh, something called Storm appeared from Xiao Wei's lab, F. Palm from the, the Sam Hess's lab. Uh, paint from Robin Hochstrasser. Remember this paint, I'll talk about it later also. Uh, paint is, is uh, also from 2006. But there's a, there was a beginning of, of a flood of, of different sorts of uh, acronyms here, D-Storm, GSDM, Blink, uh, SPDM, and so on. Uh, and, and during this time period, uh, in 2008, we did something called YFP, uh, reactivation uh, that was based on that YFP switching I just talked about, but we didn't use an acronym for it, of course. So that, of course, was forgotten, right? Since there was no acronym. So <laughs> to uh, try to uh, rectify that, uh, I'll give you one more acronym, uh, a mechanism independent one, single molecule active control microscopy, or SMACM. <laughs> so, I mean, this is just, this is just for fun, okay? Uh, uh, we don't really need more acronyms, but anyway. <laughs> Uh, it's nice if uh, you can think of this, though, in a very general way. And please note that some of these techniques don't even require using the light to control the concentration. You can, it's that general. You can use chemistry, you can use uh, enzymes, you can use binding, uh, various other sort of uh, uh, effects to control the concentration. It's that general of an idea. So let's go to some examples. Um, and I want to talk about EYFP again in this bacteria to really show you what the data look like. Here's some bacteria in white light. Uh, and you can see a fluorescence image here on the right. Uh, if I run the movie, then you can see clearly that blinking of, of YFP that I was talking about. Uh, these uh, fluorescent proteins are bound to a target protein inside these cells, and all of these little spots are only coming from inside the cells. In every frame of this movie, you fit the positions of the molecules and then uh, put that together to make a reconstruction of the, of the final structure. That's how it works. Uh, and some real examples here for three different proteins, MREB, PAR, A, and HU, you know, different names in, in, the, in the alphabet soup that the biologists create. These are the dif diffraction-limited images of these bacteria, and these are the super-resolution images. So it's because of this that there was such a great increase uh, in our ability to see structures inside these cells that there's so much excitement in this area these days. Uh, and uh, this one has to do with the, the cytoskeleton, this one has to do with separating the two chromosomes, and this particular protein binds to DNA, and so uh, this is a recording actually of where the DNA is inside uh, that cell uh, to, to high resolution. In this case, it's fluorescent protein, so it's about 40 nanometers, but if you can use small dyes, if you can use these little organic molecules, which are better emitters than fluorescent proteins, you can get down to 10 or 20 nanometers. Um, <clears throat> And a, a, a eukaryotic example is, I'd like to describe briefly uh, to contrast to the bacterial example. This is the case of that paint idea I was talking about earlier. So let me quickly explain it. Uh, you have a cell, it's live, it's growing, and it has these voltage-gated sodium channels on the surface of the cell. So what we're going to use is a labeled ligand, that is uh, a saxitoxin molecule made by our, our synthetic chemistry friends where there's been a fluorophore attached to the saxitoxin. Uh, 
These molecules zoom around in solution, so they're all outside the cell. When they're outside moving around, you don't see them. But when they bind to the surface, they make a, a bright spot. We localize those in the movie. And now all these positions here are the positions of the voltage-gated sodium channels uh, that you can observe. Um, and so uh, by, by watching this over time, it, you continuously get information on the positions of the channels. And you can create a, a time-dependent reconstruction that's on about a 500 millisecond time scale. That's sort of the average time of, of this particular movie. I, I hope it's visible. In the middle, it's partly washed out, but on the sides, it's not so washed out. And during this movie, you can clearly see that there are structures that grow and retract, grow and retract, grow and retract. These are neuritic extensions uh, outside of this uh, axonal-like projection of this neuronal model cell that you can observe uh, using these methods. Um, <clears throat> It's also possible to observe interesting structures that are uh, important for medicine. So for example, uh, in Huntington's disease, uh, there is an, a protein uh, called Huntington with an I. And when these proteins have a large number of, of Qs, a long sequence of Qs close together, uh, then these proteins will aggregate and form structures, uh, form certain ty types of, uh, of aggregates inside the cells. And so we can observe these aggregates uh, by looking with super resolution at these neuronal model cells. This is the diffraction limited images. But here are super resolution images of uh, uh, several of these. Uh, uh, they're fibril-like shapes, it turns out. Uh, a couple of microns long, a couple of uh, maybe 150 nanometers wide. Uh, even out in the neuritic extensions, the, the axonal extensions from the cell body, you can see these Huntington aggregates. This is the work of Stefan Zoll and Luke Weiss in my lab. Diffraction limited versus super resolution. So there's a, another arena of application of these ideas uh, to these neurodegenerative diseases. Now the last thing I want to talk about is some of the frontiers quickly. Um, there's uh, so much more to do to optimize this idea, to make it work better and more generally. One, one class of things that, that, that needs to be done is a new fluorophores need to be generated that give us more photons and more ways of doing active control. Here's an example of a molecule that's a, a, a rhodamine spiral pyran. It's a dark molecule until you turn it on with a control beam. And when you do, you open a, a bond and it becomes a rhodamine-like highly fluorescent dye. Uh, we can bind these molecules to the surfaces of the bacteria or use them in other ways. Here it's the surface labeling of the bacteria, and you can see the bacterial stalks, which have all kinds of different crazy shapes and lengths. All of those objects are well below the diffraction limit. Uh, that's one thing that people work on. Another thing that people have been uh, working on a lot is three-dimensional imaging, how to turn these ideas of palm, et cetera, uh, into three-dimensional imaging. And uh, I'm, I know that Harold will talk about iPalm, which is a beautiful interferometric scheme. We've been working on a different way of achieving three dimensions. Uh, what we do is to change the point spread function of the microscope optically into another point spread function, like this. This one is called the double helix point spread function. Well, let me explain for sure what this is. This is the image of a single point source. Uh, on the detector, you see two spots uh, because of some Fourier plane modifications. And those two spots revolve around each other as you move to different Z planes. In other words, the angle between the two spots encodes Z. You, and you get X and Y from the, from the midpoint between the two, and you get Z from the angle. So this allows you to uh, get a full three-dimensional image by changing the point spread function of the microscope. Uh, and that technique we have used to look at these uh, surfaces of these cells and many other structures in three dimensions uh, using uh, uh, this pupil plane modification. The idea has is, is gone into many other different types of point spread functions, different shapes, and so on. So the, to summarize all of this work, um, the, the, the uh, single molecule spectroscopy and imaging has had a very broad impact over, over many areas of science. Uh, you can see areas of physics that are involved in what I've been talking about, areas of chemistry that I've been talking about, and applications to biology. It's wonderfully, uh, wonderfully interdisciplinary. And all of this work that I've talked about and, and the achievements of, of the prize and so on uh, has, partly due to, has been partly due to the very large number of talented scientists all around the world who continue to make seminal contributions to this field. I haven't had time to talk about all the other beautiful things, FRET and uh, enzyme studies and folding and all that sort of thing, but I, I wanted to at least uh, mention that the, the single molecule idea, being able to look at that ultimate smallest object uh, and optically uh, learn things about the system is a powerful concept. Uh, I want to thank a lot of people now, and there's not time to thank everyone, so I, I certainly want to thank my current group of people that has to tolerate my, my travel schedule these days. 
Uh, <clears throat> and so here's a picture of them. And of course, by the way, we call ourselves the guacamole team, right? That's because one molecule is, of course, one guacamole. One over avocado's number of moles. Yeah, so <laughs> I, I have to apologize for this really bad joke, but you know, you, you do have to know what a mole is, and I, I, I you know, so, right. <laughs> At least our physics training is that broad. <laughs> and of course, I also want to thank uh, 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 many people, uh, my past and present students, postdocs, collaborators, nominators, the Royal Swedish Academy, mentors, institutions, and my family, and I want to particularly mention uh, my stepmother, uh, Esther Merner, who's uh, here with us today. Uh, but this takes five slides to list everyone. Uh, I, I, of course, still have to mention the uh, funding agencies, which we really appreciate for, for the, supporting this work. And finally, I want to thank you very much uh, for your attention. 45, 50.